as trans people all we want to do is just play sport and to be fair if I didn't have football I probably wouldn't be alive today and that's that's facts you know so football saved my life I just want to be a slightly shit second row in a in a team in East London. I'm I'm happy with my lot in life. This is what I do for just shits and giggles. And for some reason, me doing this for shits and giggles is somehow the end of Western civilization. Some play for the friendships, to be part of a team. Others for the thrill of competition, a chance to win. But what are you meant to do if you're barred from taking part? British cyclist Emily Bridges is told she can't now compete in her first women's event this weekend. I don't think that uh, biological males should be competing in female sporting events. The USA Swimming, the association, have finally addressed the furor of a trans swimming star, Leah Thomas. All given abuse for even trying. It ranged from being accused of being a paedophile to uh, I was a rapist and I wanted to uh, access women in, women's spaces in, in their changing rooms. The question of transgender inclusion in sport. There's science, policy and fairness to weigh up. But caught up in the controversy are real people. So where can trans females have their place in sport? And how is this debate affecting the athletes at the heart of the issue? A debate over transgender athletes competing fairly. It's not fair. Huge issue. It's not the school, it's a fact we're here. here. <sighs> this is Alex. She's a keen rugby player and she also happens to be transgender. This means Alex's gender identity as a female is different to the gender she was assigned at birth. Alex has been playing recreational rugby with her local club, the East London Vixens, for the past three years. I went down to watch her final game of the season, which she's worried could be her last ever. Emotions are mixed. Um, because when it reaches the end of the season like this, when people are talking about the things they're talking about in the media and the various governing bodies are talking about changing rules, that match might have been the last one. So um, standing in the huddle at the end, yeah, mixed, sad. People talk these days, they talk about allies, and that's what this club has been to me. They have been absolutely rock solid. And it's, it's just been, I've just been able to live life. That's why it would be really upsetting um, if that was my last match, because I found people and I found fun and I found something to do on a Sunday afternoon that's not watching TV and yeah, it would be really upsetting, sorry. Some transgender women like Alex undergo a treatment called hormone replacement therapy. It helps trans women achieve more feminine attributes by blocking a male hormone called testosterone. Under rugby football union rules, Transgender females like Alex are allowed to play domestic games in England if they undergo tests to show their testosterone is below a certain level. I, I don't have a huge issue with having testosterone levels tested and all of that sort of stuff, but yeah, it's, it just is annoying to, it's annoying to be singled out. Now, if, if it's what I have to do to play rugby, it's what I have to do and that's fine. And if it's what keep, keeps people happy, that's fine. Is it fair? Probably not. And as you saw, I'm not, the, I'm not the tallest person on the team, so my teammates would not have to be tested for their physical advantage, even though they're taller than me. Some of them are bigger than me. It's, it's that sense that it really is one rule for you and one rule for everybody else. While Alex is allowed to play with her team in a domestic league, transgender females are banned from competing in international rugby events altogether. World Rugby who make the rules for international elite competitions, say that transgender women have a size, force and power advantage that gives them a performance benefit and increases their risk of injuring other female players. I know this sounds ridiculous coming from somebody like me because I'm 53 years of age, so I'm, it's, not, it's not likely to be on my life goals, but I couldn't play in a World Cup. I would fall, because I've just been banned. What people are then saying is that there's a limit to your life. There's a limit to what you can do. While it's people like Alex whose game hangs in the balance, it's up to sporting bodies at a national and international level 
to set the rules that protect the fairness and other conditions of their sport. Trans women are usually required to meet certain conditions in order to compete, but the rules vary from sport to sport and at different levels of competition. For example, World Athletics allows trans women to compete if they keep their testosterone below a certain level. And as we've just heard, trans women can play domestic rugby in England under certain conditions, but are banned from playing internationally under world rugby rules. And this year, British Cycling banned trans females from competing while they carry out a review of their transgender policy. So what factors are these sporting bodies grappling with as they develop their guidelines? To find out more, I met with sports lawyer Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan advises a range of sporting bodies on their policy, and he says that their main aim when developing their rules is to try to ensure fair and meaningful competition. We have to police the boundary, and the reason is because the men have physical attributes which mean that women cannot compete on a level playing field. Jonathan says that sporting bodies are now considering how to balance women's opportunities in sport with the inclusion of trans athletes, and they're weighing up what conditions transgender athletes must meet to compete. And so the question becomes, well, do they have testosterone? Have they gone through puberty and if they've got all of those benefits, then the next question is, OK, well, will those benefits be lost over time? Let's say after 12 months or 24 months of dropping your testosterone, have you lost the advantages that you had? And if you, if you have, then you should be able to compete. If you haven't, or if there's still a safety issue, well, then there's a problem. Jonathan says that the rules for transgender athlete participation should be assessed depending on the sport and the level of contact. But again, you know, it depends. If it's rugby, well, there's a contact element there, so you've got to take that into account. If it's football, there's a bit of a contact element, not, not so much. So it's sport to sport and actually discipline to discipline. It's swimming now. It's got um, water polo, which is a, really a contact sport. They spend most of the time bashing each other, right? So there's a safety element there. Whereas swimming up and down a lane, there's no contact. So there's a different analysis to be done. And again, it's not about trying to be part of some sociological war or anything else. It's, a, it's just trying to create the conditions for fair competition. And the question for us is, how do we find rules that, that, that um, protect that? While sporting bodies try to draw a line in the sand on their transgender policy, it's people like Alison who are left in the lurch. For her, golf isn't just a hobby, but also a career and livelihood that's been thrown off course. Alison is a professional golfer and coach who last year competed in the qualifying rounds of the Open, but in the men's category. I am currently the, um, the only trans female member of the PGA, which is the Professional Golfers Association. Most of my tournament golf was played as someone else many years ago. And I thought that when I'd um, had, had the problems about who I am, I'm the transgender thing, I thought that I'd thrown my golf golf career away. I almost said to myself, after a month of being in lockdown, I want to play again. I'm going to train. So I've got some weights, um, my balls here. And I had a little um, thought in my head that if I'm going to play, I'm not going to play like small stuff. I'm going to play big stuff. I'm going to try and qualify for the Open. I wanted to play tournament golf again, so I had to play with the guys. And what better way to play with the guys than to play in the Open? The Professional Golfing Association require trans athletes to lower their hormones to a female level before they can compete in women's events. Alison was due to start hormone replacement therapy in 2020 but had to delay this when the pandemic broke out. This means her testosterone isn't low enough for her to compete professionally against women. She said she enjoyed the chance to play in the men's open, but it wasn't without its challenges. So the open experience for me on the whole was one of the only days in the whole year where I could go home and be okay with myself and think, you know what, I'm an okay human. I also prepared myself um, for different situations, like for going to the actual club and it being a men's event, getting to the gate, arriving as Alison, and being confronted by a marshal saying, I'm sorry, madam, but this is open qualifying. You're not due here today. And then me having to say, I'm playing. I'm actually competing. I'm teeing off in 10 minutes. 
Alison is now going along to women's golfing events. Not to compete, as the rules don't allow her, but just to see how she compares with other female players. If I play with the girls and I'm hitting it way, way further than them, at least I know. But if I never play with the girls, I'm never going to know. And the more I play, hopefully, the better research I, I, I can get. There's part of me doesn't quite feel right playing with, with the guys when I'm the only one there. But there's also part of me that doesn't quite feel right playing with the girls, knowing that have I got an advantage or not. So I'm sort of stuck. Part of me would say, well, don't play. But then again, that would break my heart. For Alison, the ability to play and compete in golf is hugely important for her mental and physical well-being. It's a game like the one that challenges you mentally. It challenges you as, as a person. You're out in the, the, the fresh air. Um, so for me, golf almost saves my life. It's like, it's like air and o o oxygen. Um, if I wasn't able to, to play golf, I know my mental health would, would decline big time. So do you think you should be allowed to compete against women? Do I think it, it's fair right now? No. Would I like to prove myself wrong? 100%, but I've got to prove it to myself to be fair first before I do it. It's got to be fair for everyone concerned. So what are the scientific factors that give men an advantage in sport? And where do transgender athletes like Alison fit into this? Well, when a male goes through puberty, a hormone called testosterone increases in their body. Now this testosterone causes a number of physical effects, including increased height, increased muscle, and increased haemoglobin, which carries oxygen around the body. Now it's these effects that mean the average male tends to be taller, stronger, and a better endurance than the average female. And it's for this reason that some sports require trans athletes to lower their testosterone before they're allowed to compete in the women's category. But there's limited research into how this transition affects trans athletes' performance. And there's some concern that athletes who've gone through male puberty retain a biological advantage that's not reduced by lowering testosterone. To find out more, I met with scientist Joanna Harper, who's also a long-distance runner and transgender. Joanna published the first ever study into transgender athletes' performance in 2015. So what sort of things do we need to consider from a scientific perspective that affect transgender athletes' performance? What effect does the hormone therapy that transgender women take have? Um, within three to four months, transgender women uh, will have hemoglobin levels that are identical to cisgender or typical women. Then there are factors that change incompletely, and, and the most notable of those would be strength. Um, trans women um, <clears throat> will lose strength, will lose muscle size. However, trans women won't go from male levels of strength to female levels of strength. And then there are parameters where there's virtually no change, such as height. And so um, it depends which of these uh, categories are most important for success in sport as to whether we can have um, meaningful competition between trans women and, and cis women. Joanna is currently researching with other scientists at Loughborough University, testing transgender and cisgender athletes to see how their sporting performances compare. But she says there's only a handful of other places running trials and that more research needs to be done on the subject. When, when we have uh, larger numbers of universities doing it, then we're going to make a lot more progress. I would tend to believe that it's probably not unreasonable in most sports to, 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 uh, to let trans women compete after hormone therapy. Um, but we don't know for sure and won't know for sure for quite some time. The science may be uncertain, but what is clear is the intense scrutiny facing trans athletes who sign up to compete in professional female events. Over the past year in particular, there's been an explosion in the media on whether or not transgender women should be able to compete in female sport. In 2021, Laurel Hubbard became the first openly transgender female to compete in the Olympics, 
representing New Zealand in weightlifting. Despite finishing last, Laurel was a subject of fierce controversy, both online and in the news. Grotesquely unfair situation where people born to male biological bodies who have an obvious superior strength and power. This morning, in March 2022, Leah Thomas became the first openly transgender athlete to win an NCAA Division I swimming title and again faced intense backlash. But Madison, it doesn't change the biological fact that he's a man, he went through puberty as a man, he has muscle structure and, 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 and everything through 22 years of his life as a man. And in April 2022, transgender cyclist Emily Bridges found herself the focus of online and media scrutiny. She was barred from competing in a women's national cycling event as she geared up to her first competition since transitioning. What should they say to Emily Bridges? And that, as you say, that advantage that's retained, whether it's in, in bone density or muscle mass, and you would think in something like, like cycling, uh, where it's, you know, the long levers really matter, the advantage is going to be even more pronounced. One transgender athlete I spoke to said that all of this media attention takes its toll. And even where sporting bodies allow trans females to compete, this isn't always the end of their problems. Sammy has always loved football. Um, I've been playing football since I was uh, four or five years old. Um, it's always been a massive part of my life. It was very much like an escape for me. I fell in love with the game and never really stopped. <laughs> The Football Association allows trans females to compete if their testosterone is within the female range, with each player reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. So under this regulation, Sammy is eligible to play professionally. And her talent is such that she was asked to sign for a professional women's side. But Sammy never played for the team after she faced a torrent of abuse on social media. I, I knew I was going to end up being the, the, the highest sort of ranked trans player at that time. and. I just didn't think I could deal with the, with the pressure that, and, the, and the stress that came with it. On Twitter alone, I had like 700 messages within about 48 hours of announcing that I had been asked to sign. It ranged from be, being accused of being a paedophile to um, being accused of only wanting to play women's sports because uh, I was a rapist and I wanted to uh, access women, women's spaces in, in their changing rooms. I've still never used a women's changing room. I'm too scared. I wouldn't go in there because I don't want to be accosted. I'd just get changed before football and go on the way. It's difficult because it's, uh, you just want to play the sport that you love. You know, I've, I've played this game for 25 years and um, for someone to suddenly say, no, you can't play, it's really difficult to get your head around because I haven't done anything. You know, I haven't done anything wrong. Sammy says she wants sporting bodies to put more rules in place to protect transgender athletes from abuse when playing competitive sports. I think I'd definitely be in a different position if, if I had had a bit more support. And um, I, I think that somebody within the FA needs to kind of come out and say, look, this is what we need to do. This is, this is the rules. That's how it is. Get on with that. And I think it's very easy to roll your eyes at the need for inclusivity when you've never been ostracised from, from something that you love. For now, Sammy finally feels in a safe space, playing recreational football. She captains Truck United, a transgender inclusive football team. In a recent friendly match, Truck side was made up entirely of trans women. The first time in history such a team has taken to the pitch. They may have lost the match 9-0, but for once, the truck players finally felt at home. I think it's the first time I ever played a football match and I feel like I'm truly accepted into it as myself, so it's a really big deal for us. But to be here as my authentic self, playing on that pitch in a fully competitive game of football on the same level, so that's, I think it's an amazing feeling. And the organiser of the team is hoping this could be the start of a brighter future for trans athletes within sport. There's never ever been a team of trans women. Well, it has now. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've gone and created a bit of history tonight. So that will be etched in the history books, which is something special as well. More of these kind of events happen. Um, hopefully will make people more accepting and, and understand that, you know, as trans people, all we want to do is yeah. just play sport. And football is a game that we all love. And football is for everyone and should be for everyone. And to be fair, 
if I didn't have football, I probably wouldn't be alive today. And that's, that's fact, you know. So football saved my life. So why are there such barriers to entry for trans people? Having fun and enjoying playing the sports they love. Well, in this case, Truck lost their game and it was a friendly league. But sometimes the results are different and the stakes much higher. US swimmer Riley says allowing transgender athletes to compete in the same category as her is taking away her rights and opportunities. Riley has been swimming since she was just five years old. This year, she competed against transgender athlete Leah Thomas in the American College NCAA Swimming Championships, and they tied for fifth place. I had one of the NCAA officials come up to me and he said, great race, um, we only have one fifth place trophy, you can hold the sixth place trophy and pose for the pictures. Yours will come in the mail, but we're going to give the fifth the fifth place trophy to Leah. At this point, I was extremely frustrated because, um, not because I didn't have a trophy. I have tons of those. Um, the point was that they turned their back on women. This was the women's national championship. It's fifth in the entire country of women. So it's, it's really incredible to get to that point. Um, it's something I've worked my whole life, especially the past four years for. Um, it was my best shot at a national title. It was just such a disheartening feeling um, watching a biological male, you know, kind of dominate everyone, um, especially on that first day when she won a national title in the 500 freestyle and seeing how many tears were shed and seeing, you know, the raw emotions of these females on the pool deck who had worked so hard to get here. The NCAA allows trans females to compete if they meet testosterone requirements. But Riley doesn't think this is fair. Especially with swimming, um, things like males have a larger heart, they have larger lungs, they have you know better lung capacity. And these are all things that play a huge role in a sport like we do. And so no matter the amount of t testosterone um, that you have or don't have, those things will not change. So do you think transgender athletes shouldn't be allowed to compete at all then? I definitely think everyone should compete. I don't think anyone should be denied athletic opportunities because that's not fair but I think there should be rules in place to either ensure people are competing with their birth assigned genders or I think honestly with swimming being so individualized you could open a new category which would still give everyone the opportunity to compete um, and I think it's the the easiest way to appease most people involved. So what are sporting bodies doing now? to ensure fair competition for female athletes like Riley, while also allowing transgender women to feel welcome in sport. I contacted the Rugby Football Union, World Rugby, the English Football Association, the Professional Golfing Association and the NCAA to ask about their handling of the issue and any upcoming policy changes. But none of them responded for comment. When I emailed British Cycling, they said they couldn't comment until their new policy is finalised, but have not yet said when this will be. I also contacted Sport England, who are responsible for growing grassroots sports, and they said they couldn't comment but sent me their transgender inclusion policy. It summarised, for many sports, the inclusion of transgender people, fairness and safety cannot coexist in a single model, and they said that each body should work to define their priorities for the sport. To get a clearer picture of where this leaves trans athletes, I spoke to Cleo Madeline from the charity Gendered Intelligence, which works to improve the lives of trans people. So do you think all this uncertainty and suspension of the rules is putting off trans people from getting involved in sport? Absolutely, yeah. I really agree that the back and forth is excluding young people, putting off trans people. So you have people who think, well, what's the point in taking up cycling because I won't be allowed to join this club or what's the point in going to the gym because I'll be excluded from the facilities. The last thing I want is for the ongoing conversation around sport, which is already quite polarized, to further devolve into trans people versus sports policymakers. But we really do want to work together. We want to try and help educate people. Cleo said it's most important that policymakers agree on clear guidelines for recreational sports and for the next generation of young transgender athletes. I think one thing that's getting lost a lot in this ongoing discussion um, is the distinction between 
elite and grassroots play. And the reason that this is happening is that it is fallout from a lack of clarity over how these guidelines ought to be applied. And the end result is that further and further down the chain, you see trans people being systematically excluded. While absolutely we are invested in the participation of trans athletes at the highest level, it's so, so important that young people have that clarity and know that they can go ahead and participate. The question of transgender inclusion in sport. So what have we learnt about how this controversy is affecting the athletes on the ground? And where can trans females go? Well, I found out that some are allowed to compete and they're enjoying playing sport for now. But the rules across different sports vary and trans women often have to meet certain conditions. When they don't meet these requirements, they can end up feeling a little lost, unsure what category this leaves them in. Plus, the raging political debate means some are worried about what the future holds, with all the online attention enough to put some trans athletes off from competing altogether. At the moment, policymakers are working to review their guidelines, but they've got to keep things fair. We want people, whether they are trans, not trans, whether they are straight, gay, whatever they are, to compete. And the only conditions we have to place on that are where it means competition is not fair. And that's what all of these sports have been grappling with all of this time. Balancing this fairness with trans athlete inclusion isn't straightforward, and it's likely more research is needed. One of the things that I tell every, every sport that has contacted me is that any transgender policy they come up with now should be considered a living document and subject to change once we get more and better data. Some say the rules for trans athletes should be more relaxed at a grassroots level. We need more open acceptance, we need more uh, of a push for inclusion. Um, I think there is a, a difference between recreational and professional sports as well. I think that's something that is probably the first step is to show that um, recreationally, anyone can play. Others just want more open conversation, to work together on a solution so they can play the sport they love. I just think you just have to keep talking to, to, to each other. If you think something's gone wrong, come and talk to me about, about it. If you don't think it's fair, come and talk to me about it. If I don't think it's fair, I'll come and talk, talk to yourself. Um, there's, there, there'll be a way, um, what that way is, and we're still debating it, aren't we? And we will be debating that for quite some time, I think. But mainly, there's a longing for things to get better. Not just for themselves, but also for the next generation of young trans athletes. This level of uncertainty, this level of just, um, if I'm going to describe fucking bullshit, <laughs> goes on. I mean, it's one thing for someone of my age and thick skin to go through this, but I can't imagine what it would be like to be 14, 15, coming out and looking at this for the rest of your life. There was nothing when I was a kid. There was no, there was no route to acceptance for me as it was when I was when I was younger and, and wanting to get continue to play football. And so I just walked away from it. And um, I lament the fact that I've had ten years away from a, a a sport and a potential career that I would have loved. And I missed out on that opportunity because of who I am. So I don't want other people to to do the same. <laughs>